Good afternoon. And today we have a pleasure of interviewing Dr. Ilya Lipkin. We're going to talk about skeletal expansion for adults as one of the additional therapy for treatment of obstructive uh, sleep apnea or other sleep and breathing disorders. And I would like to introduce Dr. Lipkin. First of all, he was my classmate in NYU Dental School, and I'm very proud what he got to the such a high level in his profession, and he's well-known orthodontist. Good afternoon, Dr. Lipkin. Good afternoon, Maria. How are you? Nice to see you. And good, good to see you. I would like to say thank you to all our audience who are listening to us alive or in recording afterwards. We're very honored to bring you uh, some knowledge and talk about the root cause of the uh, sleep disorder briefing. And if you have any friends who suffer from bad sleep or sleep next to the snoring partner, please click like and share button. This way you can help our mission to make this world a better place because well-rested person is definitely a happier person. So my first question to you, usually I do the introduction. I talk about, you know, you know, I read from bio, but for you, I would like you to tell us how you got to the high level like you are right now. Tell us about your story with the sleep, you know, sleep disorder briefing or, um, you know, sleep apnea. And uh, I would like to know, I know you took a lot of courses because I met you on a lot of courses. Tell me about the development of your style as orthodontist you are right now. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure, pleasure to be here. Um, essentially, in college, I used to do a sleep apnea tests for a living. You know, I was a polysomnography technician. Uh, and so the sleep apnea and airway was always on my radar. Uh, shortly after I finished orthodontic uh, residency, I took a lot of courses because I felt that uh, orthodontics could be either uh, a tooth alignment or tooth alignment and a health service. And I feel that uh, when orthodontists providing uh, health service, you need to understand everything, uh, you know, both, you know, joint joints and airway and, and teeth. Uh, so treat the whole, uh, uh, you know, the holistic way kind of. So, uh, and, uh, and that's uh, initially I, I used expansions uh, always in my practice early on. But sometimes I used to just to gain space for the teeth. But essentially, when uh, some of the patients started telling me that how how well they feel or how their child has gone through from third percentile to 50th, 50th percentile growth after they started breathing and sleeping, you know, a light bulb went on. Uh, I would like to tell our audience, as usual, we, as a practitioner who take care about sleep apnea patients for last 12 years, I always get those stories and they break my heart. Somebody started treatment with a CPAP machine, didn't work. You know, they cannot use the CPAP machine. Then they, you know, they come to my practice and they said, oh, can you help us with oral appliance? But even though I tried so hard with the different remedies in my functional therapy, to help them with the oral appliance, I might not be successful as well. That's why I'm so curious about other pathway I can refer my patients to. And of course, skeletal expansion, one of them. Actually, it's an important point because if I see very small mouth and the tongue is a regular tongue, uh, I understand this tongue doesn't have any other place to go besides the airway. So I see it already with oral appliance, either I have to put the jaw from here to Manhattan, or and then jaw joints cannot work with that, uh, or I have to look for other type of space. So creating more space in a transverse way would be the specialty what Dr. Lipkin can offer to our patients. Please tell us about this procedure. What exactly it is and how you come up with your own unique way of doing it? Well, first, in general, expansion itself is a very, very old uh, treatment. 
it's one of the first treatments. Essentially, the upper jaw has two halves to it, and in in uh, uh, in kids, that those two halves just connect to each other. It's the upper jaw right here. Uh, in the adults, uh, or actually anyone uh, close to puberty or in past puberty, that's locked in like this. So in in a kid, when you put an expander, it puts the pressure through the teeth onto the bone, makes the upper jaw wider. Uh, upper jaw is also base of the nose. So for every 10 millimeters of, of widening of the upper jaw, you We had a little troubles with the internet, I guess. Signature implants they, that they connect the expander to the palate. Uh, essentially, the term for it is MARPI, Mini Implant Assisted Rapid Palate Expander, or MSC, Maxillary Skeletal Expander. Not going to go fancy uh, mm -hmm. terms here. Um, but yes, and it, it works in adults, uh, and there is a uh, special techniques that make the make it possible for any age adults. Uh, and as you make the upper jaw wider, uh, essentially uh, improve the airway by uh, making breathe better. And um, better. I would like to ask you a little detail: How you actually for adults what has the suture already? you know, fused, uh, what exactly, how do you specifically open? I know I asked you that question behind the scene and you gave me very conservative answer, which I like a lot. So uh, you need to, if you, if you put a, uh, an appliance that attached to the teeth uh, in the kid, in the little kid, it will uh, uh, push on the teeth, through the teeth, translate the force to the bone, makes the uh, bone separate. In adult, like I, like I said, you have to connect it to the bone uh but uh, in adult because the suture is is locked you need to direct the force to the bone uh for the suture to come apart to break apart in in a young adult it will it will uh, uh by by putting the, the, that expander with the mini implants uh uh the suture will separate the right and left half will come apart in in the young adult in the older adult sometimes we need to use a a, a special instrument called piezotome uh, that will loosen it up the suture. And then uh, you can achieve expansion in almost, uh, not almost, um, pretty much in any uh, patient of any age. Um, uh, I know people who I offer this procedure to, they would ask, what exactly is pisatone? Great, great question. It's an ultrasonic, uh, you could call it an ultrasonic knife, but it's uh, bloodless, uh, very easy, uh, very not really very, not too invasive, even though it might sound like one, uh, but it essentially goes in right in the middle of the palate uh, and, and uh, right here uh, and, and loosens up the connection of right and left half. So this way, when the expander puts the force onto the bone, those two bones would separate. Uh, but do you have to open the gum to, to, to get to that? Or you just do it through the gum and you don't do the trauma of the outside tissue? That is correct. You got you do it right through the gum. Uh, there is obviously a minor trauma to the soft tissue, but it's very minimal, and its uh, uh, recovery is non-eventful, and there is no bleeding. Do you usually do this procedure before you put the mini implants, and do you do the mini implants in the office? I do it. You you put uh, you do the P, P, it's called piezotomy the uh, the procedure. So that goes in first, after, immediately after that procedure, we installed the expander and connect it with the mini implants right away. And you put the mini implants in there? Yes. You, know, you insert it? Yes. Excellent. So this is a very exciting treatment. And I would like you, if you can tell us what happened actually with the nose. Uh, as you're expecting, like, because the upper jaw is the base of the nose, as this gets wider, this gets wider. Uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, uh, for every 10 millimeters of expansion, you get a, a vo nasal volume increases at almost 100%. So, um, and when you breathe better, you sleep better. Absolutely. That's, I would like to ask you. That's a very common question. And I know for people who listen to my interview, they probably tired of that question. Tell us why it's so important to breathe with the nose. Well, the important part is when we breathe through our nose, uh, uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Luis Ignaro 
who received the Nobel Prize in 1998. He discovered that when we breathe through our nose, uh, uh, our body makes something that's called nitric oxide and it makes it in, in paranasal sinuses. So when we breathe in, we pull in that nitric oxide into our airway. And that's, uh, it's a natural antibiotic. So people who breathe through the nose, they have less infections. Uh, it, it's also modulate uh, uh, how we breathe, how our uh, blood supply works, uh, and uh, it regulates the pulmon or the lung uh, blood, uh, blood and uh, circulation and so on. So it's a critical uh, critical molecule that that's uh, and it, you can only get it if you breathe through your nose. That that such a, a great answer, especially I visited Nobel Prize Museum myself um, a week ago yeah i did that last summer <laughs> so like that's a, a discovery of nitric oxide definitely very close to our heart and we appreciate our audience because in our audience today we have our great friend and also somebody who is really passionate about sleep and breathing disorder and orthodontic treatment for them dr vedal so we appreciate all our audience, and especially Dr. Vidal. We actually feature her on our channel and we love her interview. So thank you, Michelle. I have a question for you, very practical question. Uh, we are very passionate about myofunctional therapy. Please tell us, how do you work with myofunctional therapy in conjunction with the skeletal expansion for adults? If you find it important, or they can just have a treatment. No, I think it's very important. Uh, you know, once uh, if it's in a little if it's in a little child, uh, I usually I usually refer to the myofunctional therapist first, so they could establish a plan. Uh, then uh, after 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 the treatment, after we after we make the expansion and make room, and they could breathe better through their nose. Uh, a lot of them still have a habit to breathe through their mouth. So if that habit is not corrected, all that work goes to waste. Uh, so it will. Uh, so it's very important that after the expansion has been accomplished, they do work with the myofunctional therapist in order to posture the tongue and in, in, uh, encourage nasal breathing. And uh, it's it's a critical uh, step in that process. So uh, we work with, very, with, with the myofunctional therapist very, very often and for adults as well. You know, habits, very hard, long-term habits. If someone haven't, wasn't able to breathe through the nose for 30 years, uh, it will be a habit. They go like this anyway, even though they can now breathe through their nose. And I've encountered them multiple times. So my functional therapy is critical. I would like to ask you about the challenges you see in conjunction with that skeletal expansion procedure. You know, people usually want to know about negative side. That's our nature. The, neg the negative side, uh, in, it's usually could only happen in, in older adults uh, where the suture might not split. Uh, so far, I haven't, you know, after I developed the piece of, not I developed, but, you know, maybe I would say perfected, maybe, <laughs> uh, the, the technique of uh, uh, designing the expander myself and actually making them myself very often. Uh, and uh, in conjunction with PISO, I, I, I haven't had any failures uh, over the last 200 patients or so. But the challenge is really, uh, you know, installing it, make, make sure it's going to work uh, uh, because, if, you know, if it doesn't work, the alternatives are, are, are very, very invasive. No, no absolutely. The, uh, please tell us about the alternative to the skeletal expansion. Well, the, the alternative to skeletal ex expansion is surgically assisted skeletal expansion. Uh, and uh, at some point when I started using piezo Tomy procedure, uh, I thought it, somebody said that it was very invasive and I thought it kind, of, it kind of sounds like but until I actually went to the oral surgery office and I saw surgically assisted palate expansion. And that was really, really medieval and brutal. So um, I, I feel that uh, skeletal expansions are much, much less invasive procedure. And, and when they work, it's a miracle. Of course. Um, I would like to ask you a very fashionable topic. Tell me about a phase one treatment for little kids. So we, of course, we want little kids not to grow up to become a sleep apnea adults. And for them, um, one of the ways of a lot of uh, general dentists and orthodontists actually approach it would be a phase one treatment 
to accomplish expansion with the clear aligners. What your opinion about that? Uh, I feel very strongly uh, about phase one treatment. We do a lot of phase one treatment and we started as early as we get the patients in the office. Uh, you know, we have some three-year-olds even and four-year-olds. Uh, there are ways to do to treat it on even younger. Uh, however, uh, scale, uh, expansion with the clear aligners is certainly not an expansion. It's changes in a dental art, in a dental arch. So if you, it, it moves the teeth. So uh, while you can make the dental arch wider, uh, aligner does not provide expansion of the base of the nose. Therefore, it's not helping to expand, to change the airway entry. So expansion with the clear aligners, it's really not a, a proper term. It's not really expansion. It's just uh, improving dental arch, which sometimes is important too. But uh, if the kids have got problem uh, breathing through the nose, uh, aligner is not going to help them. Uh, but um, again, if a kid has a problem breathing through the nose and you do the surgical expansion and they don't put the tongue up. If, if you do a conventional palate expander, uh, you could supplement it further with some uh, arch development with a clear aligner. That certainly works and I do that all the time. Um, uh, and then we have to get the kid uh, put in the tongue properly and we have to get the kid close their mouth and we have to, you know, my tape my functional therapies, my brace appliances after the expansion has been accomplished are very, very important. I would like you to give us a little bit more about the Maya brace or Health Start, that other technique, what you can kind of start really early and what's your strategy with those devices? For extremely young kids, again, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't got them that young yet. Uh, like a two-year-olds, uh, there are things like Maya Munchies and and uh, and even Healthy Start appliances. Uh, I've uh, for some three-year-olds, uh, what I've with some pacifier habits, I actually uh, removed the pacifier and, and gave them uh, a my Healthy Start appliance to a three-year-old, and 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 uh, you know they 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 just want to play with something, might as well play with an appliance. Um, so that 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 works really great. Uh, Sometimes, but older kids you know probably four and, and older uh my my brace or healthy start probably not going to work as as a starting appliances i think my personal opinion that you should uh, still expand the base get them uh get the nasal breathing improved and then you could follow it up with a removable appliance like a my brace or a healthy start they're both very similar and uh, again followed up with a, a my functional therapy uh, I, I know I would have a question from a lot of dentists who listen to us. How do you take impression for somebody who is four years old? I kind of know the answer, but I want to hear from you. We don't take impressions. We've been impressionless for the past six years. It's 3D printing and uh, uh, Itero scan or any kind of optical scan is the only answer. We haven't done an impression ever for the past few years. I think it's actually a move that phase one orthodontic forward. The fact that we don't use impression materials for kids, but I want again to feature it on my channel. Now, can I say uh -huh. something also? Not only that, uh, uh, the 3D scanning also allow, allows us not only 3D printing of the models, but also 3D printing of the appliances. So for example, you don't need conventional separators to put an expander in. And if you don't need to put a conventional uh, separators, then uh, putting appliance, uh, a fixed appliance in even on a four or three year old is, is, is much easier than it used to be. Because you don't need to fit any bends, but that's a dental talk. <laughs> mm, uh, you, just, uh, can you um, repeat that? You don't need to fit any bends. You, f you print the appliance in the office. I don't print it in the office, but I have a lab that prints them. So you could just essentially kid comes in, you put a little cement and you put it right in. And, and uh, so it, it's much more child friendly than it used to be. So Excellent. I, don't to, I don't have to put separators. I don't have to fit the rings. I, you know, you know the story. I know the story, but, but that's nice. I, I like the idea of uh, our profession being much friendlier than legendary horrible stories. Uh, I like that idea. Um, uh, I would like to ask you, after that expansion, after the surgical expansion, um, what would be 
like I don't know consequences. What would be consequential treatment? Can this treatment be done with the clear aligners, or it's necessarily have to be done with braces? Once the arch is expanded, once the you know you achieve the skeletal expansion, uh, closing the spaces and and moving teeth uh, appliance does not matter. You could do it with clear aligners. You could do it with braces. You could do it with lingual braces. Uh, whatever moves the teeth, you could move the teeth with. It doesn't matter the choice. Once once the expansion is accomplished. Um, I'm going to ask a very controversial question. And I know we discussed this lovely obstructive sleep apnea and orthodontist guidelines. And as a practitioner, I see, you know, most of my patients, they actually had four bicuspid removed. And I'm sure you see them too with a narrow palate and so forth, crowded teeth, and they go for ortho second time and a third time and everything relapses. So my question to you, um, how, you know, if you do the skeletal expansion for them, what do you do with a bicuspid place which was closed? Well, first, let me just do a, a, a quick uh, uh you know, mentioning of what we talked earlier is that uh, sometimes the bicuspid extraction by itself is not the problem. The, it's, it's essentially misdiagnosis that's the problem. Because if they have, someone has a narrow palate and they just take the four teeth out, they just misdiagnose the issue. Because some patients might have missing teeth and we may still close the space and we still expand and just bring everything forward, which leads me to the answer to your question. Uh, patients who have been misdiagnosed and mistreated with removal of the teeth uh, in, in some cases, it makes sense to protract and bring everything forward. In some cases, it makes sense to uh, reopen spaces. If it, all the roots are in a good position and the wisdom teeth came in, then sometimes I probably will just move everything more forward or to close the expansion space. If the, some of the patients who had teeth removed and, and the teeth are stick, you know, standing like this, probably opening space for uh, removed teeth will be a better choice. So it, it depends on the patient. No, that, that's a, uh, you know, that's a wonderful answer. And I really like what you mentioned, narrow palate and four by casket removed. Yes. Uh, so I would like to ask you now another fashionable question. As a, you know, I just came from dental convention in New York and a huge booth devoted to vivas. And, you know, there are some application of DNA appliance and another appliance, which I personally also use, ALF. Uh, and um, according to osteopathic theory, it helps with the beefing of the bone. But I want to know your view on DNA and on the ALF and other appliances, uh, because you look from a different position and it's, you know, really interesting. Your perspective is absolutely valuable. My perspective that those appliances, those appliances do not work as uh, what they claim to uh, to do, because essentially ALF or, or DNA or anything or AGA or anything else, it moves the teeth. Uh, unfortunately, I have a couple of practitioners around me who do use those. And then sometimes they end up in my office uh, after that treatment. And I see the roots of the teeth sometimes or the molars even or the teeth just angled this way with the DNA appliance or ALF appliance. And it provides no expansion up here so you're essentially moving teeth you could do the same thing with invisalign so i feel very strongly that uh, uh and i see that up those appliances being mostly pushed onto uh people who want to to uh to do airway dentistry and it's mostly general dentists who subscribe to that unfortunately uh because not most of them do not take home beams uh x-rays and 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 they don't really see what they've done because you once you may see an improved dental arch and wider dental arch, but the root position and the physiology and, and sometimes very, very bad consequences can result from that. Uh, I have a question related to diagnosis of that. Do you, uh, what situation you use the sleep study to help you with your treatment and how you you know, since you have a lot of experience with the sleep study, you know, for the last 25 years or your experience 25 years ago, tell me your approach towards the 
uh, you know, sleep disorder briefing diagnosis and use the sleep study as your guidelines, or maybe you use some other things as a guidelines. I have my local, not mine. I have a local sleep lab that that uh, uh, we work with very closely. Uh, so very, I have a lot of patients that come directly from the sleep lab. I, the physician there, they, she refers patients to me for uh, the, for the treatment. So, and in 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 some instances, we will ref, if they have a sleep study that's done before the treatment, we I would follow up with the after to make sure that what I've done is actually. Uh, you know, substantiated and, and uh, proved that, you know, that it did work. Uh, as, however, in, in, in some of the cases, I not, I'm not necessarily will send them for a sleep study because if they, uh, you know, because if they have a narrow palate, I'm going to do expansion whether they have a sleep study or not. So, and then usually our parents would report that how child or adult for that matter have improved. And, and uh, so a lot of it, would be a subjective, just a symptomatic uh, reporting. Uh, but sometimes uh, if the patient is on the fence, let's say I tell them that they're, I could see the problem and the parent or the patient is not sure, but they want to check before they start the treatment, I will refer them for sleep study for sure. So you, you don't, uh, but my question to you, do you measure the value of the airway? Like I understand you do the measurement of the base of the nose. I learned that, but uh, I don't know what other criteria you use to make sure, you know, that's enough so when, expansion. When I, when, when I take a comb beam CT, which I've had for the last 16 years, uh, essentially, I measured the, the width of the nose inside and I measured the width of the palate on, on that comb beam uh, x-ray. And then uh, the, there is, you know, this it's something that's very uh, been long established that there is a certain average width that has to be between the molars and a certain width of relationship of how the upper jaw should be in relationship to the lower jaw. So I, I measured an absolutely every patient. So yeah. you don't really measure volume per se, but the width and, uh, and then you could, clearly see sometimes if someone's got very, very narrow nose and almost no air. And then after the expansion, you could see a lot the passages the nasal passages being much bigger. And you could physically measure the, the width of the base of the nose and even inside between the, uh, between the nostrils. It's very clear. So basically, you measure whatever is around the turbinates that that yeah. that so you you see more spaces between the turbinates and the, you know, outside of the nose. Correct. Yeah. So it's a very promising treatment. And uh, um, uh, I, um, the important things, I want uh, to give us uh, the practical advice to the parents, what age they should be evaluated, or maybe what parents should you know, look and get concerned or curious and bring the child to orthodontist. So please share with us the practical tips what parents have to look for. Well, first of all, uh, the most important is snoring. If the kid is snoring a loud breathing when they sleep, no matter what the age, it's a, it's a red flag right there. Um, so essentially, if uh, uh, because kids should not be snoring, period. The, the snoring in the kid is is a, is a sign of sleep apnea. So they should be bringing the child in uh, either to orthodontist or ENT uh, as soon as they see it happening. Very often, it starts with enlarged tonsils, not noids. That's why the ENT member of the team is so important. Uh, any parent could go online and find a pediatric sleep questionnaire, and they could uh, go through it. Uh, we, we give it to every patient who walks in the office, either adult or kid. And uh, uh, the, the parents should, should go through that questionnaire. And if they answer at least three or four yeses on that questionnaire, that means the problem is there, even I might not be aware of it, such as, you know, grinding of the teeth, uh, a kid's waking up with a dry mouth in the morning, uh, a kid's not feeling tired in school or, or uh, any symptoms of ADHD, about 30% of uh, age, ADHD cases is misdiagnosed. Uh, those kids have uh, sleep problems and not ADHD. And uh, there is tons of research that shows when they uh, get uh, airway improved, such as by removing tulsas and adenoids and expansion, 
uh, uh, at least 30% of ADHD cases completely resolve. So parents just uh, should should uh, follow up with the you know look for those symptoms, look for the questionnaire, and and uh, if they answer yes to any, then uh, they should be bringing a kid to a specialist. Thank you very much, Dr. Lipkin. It was an amazing interview, and I learned a lot, and I'm sure my audience got very excited about different ways they can um, they can address the root cause of the disease. Actually, you know, anatomical, that's the root cause, of course. Thank you very much, and we're looking forward to bring you on the channel again. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.